<laughs> Greetings and salutations, and welcome to Radio Days, a podcast radio program that delves into the world of terrestrial radio. It's DJs and on air personality, and you, all fans of radio as a medium. Here's your host, Ron. Hey there, and welcome to Radio Days, the podcast. Today's episode is produced by Ron Robinson Studios. If you need professional marketing videos, professional photography, headshots, or drone content from a licensed drone pilot, head over to ronrobinsonstudios.com. You can also hear previous episodes of Radio Days, the podcast there as well. And again, this podcast can also be heard on Spotify, Apple Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, among other streaming services. I also want to give you a brief update on the documentary movie, about the history of radio. Shooting has wrapped, and I'm in the editing post-production phase. Look for this documentary, Radio Days 101 Years of Radio, coming soon. Stay tuned, and as I get closer to finishing the editing process, I'll announce an exact release date, so stay stay tuned for that. And if you'd like to help out and become a producer for this movie, click on the Patreon or PayPal links at ronrobinsonstudios.com, or if you're listening on the Buzzsprout page, go ahead and hit that heart, heart icon. If there is a radio personality or musician that you'd like to hear more about, shoot me an email at ron at ronrobinsonstudios.com. Well, my guest today is music royalty, ladies and gentlemen. She has influenced scores of artists, including Joan Jett, KT Tunstall, and the Go-Go's, one of my favorite all-time bands. Uh, And she's one of the very few musicians to front a band as a bassist, and I don't think enough attention is brought to that. Very cool. With hit singles like Can the Can, Stumbling In, and Devil Gate Drive, she has sold over 50 million records. Let me say that again. 50 million records worldwide and she continues to produce and release new music today which is very very cool also you might know her from happy days she played leather tuscadero and did i mention that she turned down a date request request one time from the king elvis presley which i'll be asking her about as well ladies and gentlemen please welcome detroit's own and michigan rock and roll legend hall of famer Susie quattro Susie, how are you I'm absolutely fine. That's a hell of an intro. I appreciate that. Well, I want to make <laughs> you feel I welcome. Follow, how can I follow that? You know. <laughs> well, you know, before we get into your musical career, I have to ask you because doing my homework for this for this uh, this interview today, Susie, I, I learned that you, uh, and I don't know if this is still the case, but I saw that you were kind of uh, you didn't like to to fly. And as someone who gets nervous and all worked up before I fly, I want to ask you. Do you still hate the flight? And if so, how do you deal with it when you do have to travel? Um, there are two different kinds of people in this world. One is the person that doesn't mind at all flying and the other that does. And the way you deal with it is don't pretend you're the other than what you are. Right. So I used to be, oh, I'm fine. If I'm not fine. <laughs> so now, now that I've accepted that in myself as a personality quirk, You know, I even, you know, even before we take off, I'll often make friends with the stewards and I'll say, hi, they they always know who I am, of course. And I say, and I say, listen, I'm a nervous flyer. Can you do me a favor? And as soon as we take off and you're allowed to get up from your little seats at the front of the aircraft, can you bring me a drink? Because it calms me down and they do it immediately. So, um, and everybody wonders why this person in the front is getting a drink. They see them coming directly to me, but it's it, it's just don't bullshit yourself. You know, if you are, you are. I fly over 200 flights a year. Um, I'm fine. I do the flights, but I'm never going to love it. So why pretend I do? You know, I used to take like a happy pill, but one time we were, me and my wife were flying to Vegas and she gave me half one. And when we got there, it actually worked out that night. We were going to see a band that's on my, was on my bucket list to see the temptations. Obviously Otis Williams was only the original one, but I don't remember anything about the show. So from there on, I said, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. I'll, I'll, I'll bare knuckle it. And so I'm going to take your advice. Bring me a drink. No, no, it, it is, it is accepting in yourself that this is how you are yeah. and it's not a sin. And then once you do that, then you get to the point where you've relived that in your head so many times about something happening and you're going down that it's, it's actually anticlimactic in the end. Well, I will, I will give that a try. I'll try to be more accepting, accepting. accepting. All right. Before we get into musical career, I want to ask you as a youngster, uh, I know you grew up in the Detroit area. What, and who were you listening to on the radio? Well, I was a top 40 girl. Um, I have my influences. Elvis was from the age of five and a half. I don't know if we're going to get into that story later, but from the age of five and a half, he was my guy. Um, 
Motown, huge from Detroit, huge influence, both backing vocalists and bass playing, obviously. Otis Redding, huge influence. Songwriting wise, Bob Dylan, huge influence. Um, I loved Can Heat. And believe it or not, Billie Holiday, huge influence. Billie Holiday. Just to learn her phrasing, just to learn how to sit behind a beat on a vocal and catch up at the end of it. That's cool. That's, that's, well, those, that's cool. You kind of explained to you a little bit of your influences there because, I mean, I mentioned you, so many people have been influenced by, by you. You know, I mentioned besides you and Sting, and maybe there are others, I don't know many people who have fronted a band as a bass player. I mean, do you realize how unique you are in that aspect? Everybody, everybody says this, everybody. But I have to say, um, and I don't like to bullshit, so I say the facts. I, I first of all, I am a percussionist. I was in the school orchestra. So that's everything, using all your hands and your feet. Um, I play piano, which is a percussion instrument. So that's two hands and the pedals. And then when I learned bass at 14, I learned I, I, at the same exact time that I was learning how to play bass, I was becoming the fun person of the pleasure seekers. So yeah. in a way, I didn't connect in my brain that this might be difficult. All I knew was I'm playing bass and I'm singing lead. So somehow, without questioning it, I made it all work. So in a way, it worked in my favor. That's cool. You know, everybody gives Kid Rock, uh, you know, props for playing all the instruments. But you know, we mentioned you being a, a, an established bass player. But didn't you start, like, in your dad's band playing the drums? Is that true? Did I read that right? I played bongos first. That was my first instrument at seven years old. And a little cute story. It's good for your show. Close to Christmas time, I was seven. I went around the house looking for my presents, like, well, like any self-respecting kid does. Right. And uh, I went into his cupboard in his bedroom and I found this beautiful, beautiful, expensive looking pair of bongo drums. And me being me, I'm an honest merchant. I don't know how to lie. I just don't know how to do it. Um, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I found my Christmas present. And he said, what? I said, the bongo's in your closet, in your bedroom. He went, do you know that those bongos cost $200? I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, do you honestly think I'm going to give a $200 pair of bongo drums to a little seven-year-old girl? And I went, oh, oh. And Christmas Day, they were mine. Now, you know, just about everybody, especially here in the States, knows about the British invasion that happened here in the States, but not too many know about the American invasion that happened across the pond in the 70s. group like yours and Sparks and others made a big splash in Europe. First, though, you moved to England, I think, in 1971 and started working with Mickey Mose. Could you talk about that partnership and the impact that your band made in the UK? Sure. Um, I was in the Pleasure Seekers first, and then that changed into Cradle. That was from 14. Then when I was 18, 19, it changed to Cradle. The band changed. It was still an all-girl band, and I was, instead of being the total front person, because we were really out of touch, we were a show band in the Pleasure Seekers, and then the festivals were happening, and we were we were not popular then, you know, it was a different kind of, so we decided to change the band and I went backwards a bit and little sister came in singing lead and I just played a bit. At that point, um, we started to write our own songs and I wasn't obviously as happy in that band because I like, I'm an upfront girl. That's who I am. You're an but alpha. Accept, you, you were definitely an alpha. Yeah, sure. But I did accept the try to change the format. I understood that. So that was the band that Electra Records saw me in first, and they offered me a solo contract. I did two songs, lead only. And that same week, Mickey Most came to Detroit to record Jeff Beck at Motown Studios. My brother found out, got him to see the band. I did two songs. Mickey offered me also a solo contract. Same week, crazy time. Electra Records, Jack Holtzman said, I want to take you to uh, New York and put a male band around you and turn you into the next Janis Joplin. And I went, eh, ee, ee, ee. Mickey Mo said, I'll take you to England. we we'll make an album and you'll be the first Susie Quattro. And I went, that's what I want. Right. That's yeah, no, that's so, yeah, because I'm not, I'm not Janis Joplin. You know, I love her, but you won't, you wouldn't compare me to her. That's not who I am. 
I'm a rocker. She was more blues. Uh, and she's not a musician. I'm a bass player. I'm a serious bass player. So Mickey saw who I was. It, and the, just the end of the story, this is a fun little bit. Um, M- M- Mickey saw me do two songs. And he you know, did this, went to the back of the hall. We talked. And he called his wife that evening back in London. And he said, Chris, 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 I found it. At last, I found it. And she said, what did you find? He said, I don't know, but I found it. Perfect. You know, it's, Perfect. it's funny. I don't you, know. <laughs> it's funny you say that because one of my favorite lines of any movie is in Ray. And someone is asking, you know, obviously it's Jamie Foxx playing Ray. And he says, how do you how do you do this so well? And he says, I just make it do what it do, baby. And I think that's perfectly. I don't think that the, 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 the talented ones like yourself really know it. You just do what it does, right? I'm I'm very honest about it. I, you know, everybody talks about I was the first and I was, I didn't have a blueprint. I had to find my own niche. And I, all I know is that I didn't fit anywhere. This right. is what I was sure of. I'm not that, I'm not that. So what am I? So what that forces you to do when you know you have something is to you have to find your niche. So I found my niche and my niche was had not been done before. So I'm happy to say I'll take that to my grave, which I didn't know at the time I was doing uh, until the documentary in 219, Susie Q. Um, I was just simply sticking to me, knowing I didn't fit and refusing to compromise, whatever it was this was. Right. I couldn't have, I can't explain it. I can explain it now better because I'm older. But at the time, I was just being me and I refused to change. I refused to compromise who I was for anybody. And it worked because your first single called Rolling Stone reached number one in Portugal. Talk about going deep at your first at bat. That must have been a huge thrill. Mickey was doing all these recordings with me and Mickey, bless his soul, um, he didn't know how to capture me on record. And he's the first to say so. He just, like he said to Chris, I don't know what she is. He knew I was something. Right. He believed in me as a star, but he didn't know what I was. So M- Mickey didn't know who I was, and he would be the first one to say that. Um, but eventually, I got my band together, my my UK band, and uh, we went on the first ever Slade tour. It was the opening act. And then everything, the jigsaw puzzle came together. Everything came together. Uh, we were doing all my own songs. I had my own band. And it was at that point after the Slade tour that Mickey said, yes, I now know who and what you are. And let's get Mike and Mike Chapman and Nikki Chin, let them come see your act, which is all original material. Maybe they can write that magical three minute commercial right. for what you do, which is what they did. And it worked. It worked very well. Well, that's a good segue because there's a couple of specific singles that I want to ask you about. One is a song that I have not been able to get out of my head in the last couple of weeks, Can the Can, which, by the way, went number one in Europe and Australia. Talk to me about the origin of that song, and can you please tell me what Can the Can means? Well, when you have something that is valuable, you can it. You put it away safe, put it away safe, and it sings good. Um, And with my American accent, Can the Can, not Can the Can. That was after Mike and Nikki were asked to, to write us a single. They came to a show that we were doing and they heard all my own stuff, which was very first album. Just listen to the first album. It's boogie based. And uh, Mike went away and made it wrote can the can. And he made a demo of it, which was just noisy, screeching guitars with his voice over the top. And we went down into the rehearsal room. And I have to say the whole band at that point put their bits in. You have to say it that way. Right. We heard what he did. We, we we got the vibe of what he was trying to do. The drummer put in that the signature Susie. Oh, it's a great way to start a song. I mean. That was his idea. Um, I found that nice rolling bass, but that unusual little, you know, it's all Jameson influence. And then he came up with that. And then Mike said to me, let's find the key for you. And he went, sing it here. Sing it here. Higher. Sing it here. Sing it here. I went, Mike, I'm at the top of our age. That's the key. I said, thank you very much. And then when we were putting the song down in the studio, there was that little middle bit where I play that nice little bass bit. And Mike said, we need something right here. And I said, give me a minute. 
And I went out into the studio and I did my famous. Wow. Wow. Right. And any woman screaming is going to be a number one. <laughs> I love it. Go. I love it. I, Cause you know, I mean, Dave Neal, I mean, he was just a great, great drummer, wasn't he? He was the best. And he passed about two, three years ago now. And I, I have to, he's around right now because people keep bringing him up. Um, he did a gig for me in Switzerland and my, my normal drug, he left the band ages ago to save his marriage and the marriage broke up. Anyway, we always stayed friends. I love Dave. Uh, the gig came up in Switzerland where my normal drummer couldn't do it. And I had a choice between Dave or another drummer who had taken Dave's place. And Dave Neal begged me, begged me, begged me, please, Susie, let me do the show. 10,000 people, Zurich. Okay. So I said, okay, Dave. And he practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And we did the show. And my husband, who books me, he even said, wow, this song, that song, this song. I said, that's because he played it. Right. So, you know, whenever another drummer plays it, Dave played it. So it's his beats. Anyway, he did a brilliant job. We all flew home. And the day after he got home, he slid off the chair and he had a stroke and he was in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Mm. And he died about two years ago now. And the last time he came to my, the, my premiere in London of Suzy Q in a wheelchair and I made everybody applaud him. But the last time I saw him privately, which was at a, a what do you call it? A care home that he was living at. He's in a wheelchair. And it's important people hear this, I guess. I had to ask the question. I had to ask the question. I said, Dave, did you doing that gig in Switzerland with me cause your stroke? I had to know this for myself. I'm sure that bothered you. Big time. And he was quiet for a minute. I think he was really considering his answer. And we're very close. We're like brother and sister. And finally, he said to me, Susie, it didn't caused the stroke, but it didn't help. He gave you an honest I could, answer. Oh, I could live with that. Yeah. I could live with that. So in other words, it was going to happen, and maybe that accelerated it, but that's okay. He wanted to do the gig, and I, I didn't want to be the cause of it. Sure. You know, but, um, sure. And, uh, yeah, it, it was just, um, oh, bless him. What a good drummer. Thank you for sharing that. That's I'm sure that wasn't easy. Uh, another song I wanted to ask you about is Devil Great Drive, another great jam and tune. Talk about the, how that came to be. That's that's a great song. Uh, Mike wrote that. In fact, it was the beginning of 1974. She would have like four hits. And I remember sitting in the office. This shows the genius of both Mickey Most and Mike Chapman, the genius. Sitting there talking. And Mike turned. M Mickey turned to Mike. And he said, Mike, Susie now needs another number one. And Mike went, okay, amazing. But what Mickey did was he punched Mike in his creativity, challenged him, and Mike came up with it. And we did that really real. We were out in the street screaming past the microphone. The motorcycle was going by. Right. I came up with it. Hey, y'all want to go down to Devil Gate Drive? It's one of those songs that, um, and it doesn't happen often. I can name five, if I think about it, who capture that live element. And they're very few and far between. Very few. And it's one of the favorites around the world. As soon as you say that, it's like a, hey, y'all want to go? Yeah, you know, it's just great. Um, all right. You also recorded Elvis Presley's All Shook Up. I bring that up because, as I mentioned at the top, uh, is it true that you once turned down a date with Elvis? Could you tell us that story? Was it a date? But... <clears throat> Elvis has been sat on my shoulder spiritually since the age of five and a half. And there are things that have happened in my life that you cannot invent. Okay. If I got to tell you the whole thing now that you asked, you can edit it how you like, but it's important that you hear the whole thing. Five and a half watching the Ed Sullivan show as much. I don't know how old you are, but this was a Sunday night entertainment for every American family variety show. Everybody sat down at eight o'clock and watched it. So I'm five and a half. Five kids in the family. At the end of the show, he always brought out something for the kids. He says something for the youngsters. Elvis comes down. Don't be cruel. I'm five and a half. My elder sister, by nine years, 14 and a half. So she starts screaming. And me being so young, I looked at her and I went, what? 
What's the matter with you? Then I turned and looked in the TV. I went in. And little light bulb, I am going to do that. True story. Okay. Next, I have to tell you all the little things, and I'll get to that one. Um, I was uh, 18, been in the band since 14. We were in a hotel somewhere. On comes the comeback special. Watched it and decided leather was my image. Then we come to 1973, making my first album. And Mike knows what a big Elvis fan I am. And we cover All Shook Up. Okay, then 1974, that record is released in America, gets in the lower end of the charts. I'm in uh, Memphis doing a tour. And the phone rings. And it's Elvis's people, initially. Picked up the phone in the hotel room. They said, oh, this is so-and-so, and so we have Elvis Presley for you. <gasps> Excuse me. Talk about all shook up. Um, and he said, I heard your version of all shook up, and I think it's the best since my own, and I'd like to invite you to Graceland while you're here. Wow. And I said, I'm very busy. <laughs> wow. I know. Not because I was scared, because I... Thought it wasn't the right time yet. Okay. Not quite right. You were very self-aware even at that young age. I just got to run you through these. So uh, then we're in 1977. I fly from Japan to LA and I audition by request for the part in Happy Days. Um, Leather Tuscadero is called, of course, what could be better than me. Um, I did the reading, met the director, met the Fonz, da, da, da. They said, okay, Go back to your room and we have to discuss you and we'll call you in your hotel room. So I'm in the hotel room and I'm waiting for the phone to ring. I turn on the TV. The phone rings. We don't just want you for this two part episode. We want you for 15 episodes. I went, wow. Wow, So as I'm being excited, the TV goes, newsflash, the king has died. Oh, man. No, you can't write this stuff. So then, okay, so that's that. So I'm happy, sad. Then I go back about three months later to film my first episodes of Happy Days. And the director brings over a guy. He said, Susie, um, say hello to Nudie. He's going to be making your clothes for the show. I went, great. Elvis's personal tailor. No, you can't write this stuff. Uh, then I heard from Elvis's last girlfriend that he used to go to Rodney Bingenheimer's uh, what was it called? Uh, English disco. And they go to the VIP room at the top. And Rodney Bingenheimer was a huge fan and he played nothing but my music. And Elvis used to sit there and stare at my poster and listen. So this is crazy. Then finally, the final thing is I wrote a tribute to him. You can Google it called Singing with Angels. It's now recorded by lots of Elvis impersonators. It's played at funerals and it's become a cult hit. I wrote this song sent it to James Burton and Ray Walker from the Jordanaires. At first they were against even the idea. Then they heard the song and they said, book the session. So I booked it and I recorded it with all his people in Nashville. Wow. This song tribute. You've got to hear There's a video to it too. Uh, And the very last one is we were there doing the session with James Burton and the, and the, and the real Jordanaires, even the guy um, Stokes, he got out of his, he had had a, a mild heart attack and he got out of his hospital bed to come to the session to do this song. Amazing. And I was playing James Burton, part of my new album, and he was listening to it on headphones. We're taking a break recording Sing Him With Angels, which is what it's called. Sing with, it's my tribute to the king. And I take a little break and he's listening to my stuff. And he took the headphones off and he said, this is my final Elvis thing. He said, Susie, you have what Elvis had. I went, pardon? I knew you could have knocked me down with the fellow. I said, pardon? What do you mean? He said, well, the only way I can explain it is this. Whatever you do is you. And I went, I, I just had a funny feeling when I said that. I'll take that to my grave. Well, it's probably why there was so much serendipity between you and the king. I mean, you talk. I mean, you just mentioned five or six things on their own would be amazing. But I mean, it's just it was so much serendipity. That's 
it was. a great story. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a little bit, because we'll, I know you mentioned Happy Days, but I have a couple questions that later on. But I wanted to ask you this, because another thing that I saw uh, preparing for this interview, Susie, is one of my favorite bands, Slade. I, I've loved them when I was a kid. Uh, uh, you toured with them, and I only bring this up uh, because uh, I know you toured with them before uh, your song, She's in Love, which I love that song. But I have to ask you your thoughts about uh, another favorite song of mine because it was a 1984 hit, Run, Run Away. Their song, which was recorded six years later after yours, however, it sounds a lot like She's in Love with You. Did you ever notice that similarities? Has anyone ever asked you about I that? I never did. I never did. And, you know, they write their own stuff. Maybe they did do that on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, go back and listen sure. to it. You'll be amazed. I, to me, I, Okay, I'm going to yeah, do that. Yeah. Gonna, but you know that there's an album by Quattro, Scott, and Powell, which is myself, Andy Scott from The Suite, and Don Powell from Slade. And it charted in Australia, got to number 16. And, in fact, that my recent, my solo show, I was on stage for two and a half hours, my son came out for two songs because we worked together, and Andy and Don came out. We did two songs together. That's oh, awesome. just, but yeah, um, I, I never noticed that, but I will listen. Yeah. Now she's in love with you. You going back to an earlier question you had is one of the only two songs in my entire career that I had to practice playing the bass and singing because the bass line on "She's in Love with You" is. And it, you're like a metronome. Boom, but you can It's like a machine. Right. All the way through. And the vocal. Well, if you see her all alone, talk up to her discreetly. So you come behind it. So this you have to not think about. And the vocal goes behind. Had to practice that. Now I don't think about it at all. That but that was that was a difficult one to to make the vocal relax behind that machine bass part that's awesome um as we have we talked a little bit earlier most of your early success happened overseas but your biggest hit in the states obviously was probably your duet with chris norman called stumbling in could you talk about how that came to be and 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 what did that single do for your career um i had other other lower end of the chart stuff and everybody obviously knew because i was touring there since 74 constantly then happy days household name um we were at an award ceremony in germany in cologne we were also recording the if you knew susie album at the same time so we went to the award ceremony and then went to an after hours party after the award ceremony lots of famous people there and there was a band on to entertain and i kept going to all these other famous people and saying let's go jam nobody wanted to do it nobody Oh, I'm not working tonight. Exactly. So let's go jam. Nobody would do it. So finally, I grabbed Chris, non-negotiable, grabbed him and dragged him on the stage. So we started to play and sing and have fun. And Mike Chapman happened to be there because he's producing our album and he's watching everything. And he was at the award ceremony. And he liked what he saw and he liked what he heard. And the next day in the studio, he came in. We're at the session. And he, it's very strange. He walks up and he said to the engineer, do me a favor. Can you please switch on this mic, plug my guitar, and Susie, get on the piano. I went, okay. And he said, now, whatever I sing now, I want you to copy on the piano and go, duh, 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 duh. I went, all right. all right. So he went, he got his guitar and he went, our love is alive. Duh, 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 duh. And so we begin, duh, 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 duh. take just the chorus. Thank you. Switch off the tape and give me a copy. And he went, that's great. Now I have to write a verse. <laughs> oh, man. Amazing. And when we recorded it, Mike actually said, um, which was clever, he said, I want you both to stand on your mics facing each other. I'm not going to do um, where well, you do your part, you do yours, and I overdub it. No. You two have just got up at a bar, just like what I saw. it. You just got up at a bar. And you're singing this song. You're just ad living it. One shot. That, no cuts. That's one the, shot. That's what you get from that song. He was clever to do this. It was actually Chris and me looking at each other and singing the lyric. And that's why it worked. So very clever of Mike to do it that way. Not manufactured. That's cool. Excellent. You know, one yeah. of my, one of the, I, I don't know who did, but somebody made a video of you performing that song recently and him performing this song not so you know recently and kind of putting it together it's kind of cool i'll have to 
find that and send it to you. Uh, it's, it, it's a great song. It was a great vocal by both of us. Great song and a wonderful moment in rock history. Now, we talked a little bit earlier. You made quite a splash on the TV show Happy Days. For me, it was one of my favorite shows. I, I was a big Pinky Tuscadero fan. I mean, I thought she was the hottest thing since sliced bread. Uh, but as Leather Tuscadero, you mentioned you was the – because you mentioned earlier your your thing was the leather. Was that – name for you or was that already a, a role like leather tuscadero was the character and it was just kind of like you how how did that opportunity present itself and was the was the name changed because of who you were or was it always leather tuscadero and you kind of went in there well i heard about it um once i got involved in the show obviously uh they had they knew that pinky was leaving they were going to have contractual problems so they liked the tuscadero thing and they came up with a kid sister and they named it Leather Tuscadero. That was before me. And they had that script, I think, for about six months. They could not find what they were looking for. Couldn't find it. They were looking for somebody who was tough and vulnerable, who could act and possibly could sing. Here I and am. Wait. Here I am. And, right? So then the casting director went into her daughter's bedroom. Her daughter had a collage of Rolling Stone covers on her wall. Mine was on there from 75. And she looked at the dog and she said, who is that? That's who we're looking for. She said, that's Susie Quattro. They got in touch with me in Japan. I was on tour and I flew over and I got to part. It was perfect. And Ronnie Howard and Henry, I've stayed friends with both of them. And I one time in a conversation with Ronnie, I said, I'm curious. Did it ever feel, and I want your honest answer, did it ever feel like I was acting for the first time? And also, did it feel like I was a new person to the show? And he said, no, you're a natural actress. And no, you were always in the show. That's awesome. That's the, all you can ask oh, for, what right? What a compliment. What a compliment. Yeah. Well, who came up with it? Because I mentioned Pinky had that little snap of the fingers thing. How did you come up with the snap in your leg and pointing? He we were talking, the director, he said, since I'm her little sister in the show, I needed a bit of business. I suggested that, but that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we tried a few different things, but the, and finally I kind of went bang, bang. I can't remember who did it. Somebody went pow, and I went, oh, yeah, that, I like That'll that. That'll work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned Ron Howard, uh, uh, Henry Winkler. I mean, you want to talk about a great actor. Did you, because uh, there's many stories that have come out that him and Pinky, the real Pinky actress, didn't get along on the set. How did you find getting along on the set? Did you fit in or did you kind of look I was, different? You know, I tell you what, the, the, when I, I've come over from England as a star, okay? And I could, I didn't want any of them to feel that I was coming over with any kind of a star attitude whatsoever. So on the first rehearsal date, we're all in the Arnold's, everybody's there. And I made a little speech and I said, first of all, everybody, uh, yes, I have lots of hit records under my belt. Yes, I'm very famous. I said, but I want you all to know something. I've never acted before. This is my first ever acting job and any help that any of you can give me, much appreciated. Very smart just to, to kind of expose yourself like that and, and ask for help. That had to be huge. It helped me big time. And in fact, there were times when Ron would say to me after rehearsal, Susie, come up a little bit on that line or go down. Very helpful. But Henry was a little shit, and we laugh about this all the time. Standing backstage ready to go out for my first entrance, my first ever acting job. The audience is a little bit nervous. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm like this, you know, I got the script behind and I'm, I'm waiting to make my entrance. Henry comes up and he says, you nervous? I said, a little bit. I said, don't worry. You're going to kill him, Susie. You're going to kill him. He said, you're on. So out I went and I sauntered over as leather tusk if there were. <laughs> and I got to my spot on the floor and I'm ready to speak my first line. And the director in front of the audience says, Excuse me, Miss Quattro, what are you doing here? I went, what? He said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, it's my cue. And I said, you got another page. <laughs> but I went back and Henry was on the floor. And I said, you bastard. That's funny. He said, you know what, Susie? Now go and enjoy it. 
That's awesome. Said, what more can go wrong? He's right. What he sent me out on purpose. He saw the nerves, you know. So thank you, Henry. And I came out to huge applause, like I'd been there forever. You know, it's great. That was a clever thing to do. And Ronnie said to me one time, maybe three or four shows, and he said, Susie, whatever you do, don't ever take acting lessons. I said, why? I said, why are you saying that? He said, because whatever you do is organic, it's natural, and acting lessons would ruin that. So that I took that as a big compliment, actually, big compliment. Before we move on from Happy Days, do you have a favorite episode that you were in? The best acting one was when I went out with Ralph Melf when I had to try to be a lady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you were you were in a leather. You were in that pretty prom dress, right? Yeah, yeah. That was good. And that was challenging because even the director came to me and he said, this is an important episode for you because you're not playing any music. This is just your acting ability. So you have to make this count. I said, okay. And I had a wonderful scene where I come to the, the door of the Cunningham house and I had dialogue, 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 dialogue. And I get to Marion. And then I say at the end of the dialogue, I, I want to learn how to be a lady. Right. Right. And we were running overtime and they cut my dialogue. And they said, just go from knocking on the door, walk across straight to Marion and say, I want to learn how to be a lady. I went, there's all my motivation is gone. <laughs> so it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And finally, I said to the director, I think I know how to make this work. Give me one more shot. He said, okay. So I knocked on the door and I did this certain saunter and look in my eye that was the dialogue, said my line, cut, perfect. What did you do? And I said, easy. I imitated Joan Jett imitating me. <laughs> I love that. That's a true story. Wow. And because Joan interpreted me a certain way and it came out her body, her way. And I thought, that's what this needs to be. Right. It took the place of the dialogue. I thank Joan for that many times. Many times I said, thank you. you know? <laughs> that's awesome. Another show, Susie, that showed you a lot of love was WKRP in Cincinnati. In fact, I have to give this show credit for me kind of reaching out to you to do this interview because after Henry Hesman passed, I went down a KRP rabbit hole, if you will. And I don't know if you were aware, but there are several episodes where you can see a Susie Quattro poster in the WKRP. Oh, I know. I've, been told. I've been told. I've yeah. been told. Um, you've worked on in television a number of times besides those, besides happy days. Could you talk about some of your other TV experiences that you've worked in over the years? I've been on lots of stuff. Um, you're not just talking America. You're talking everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. I've a big, big, big show. In fact, they're shown everywhere. A big show here called Minder, one of the most popular shows I did. Dempsey and Makepeace, I was on that. I was on Midsummer Murders, and I know that was shown in America. Uh, I did Absolutely Fabulous. Um, that's I my host. favorite. That That's my favorite. I think you're great in that. Um, I did Midnight Special in America. I hosted that. Uh, I was on the... Mike Douglas show with Tony Curtis and Sammy Davis Jr. Um, God, I've done everything. Well, you know what? I'm going to ask you a follow-up question to that. Tony Curtis and, and Sammy Davis Jr., when I was growing up, there were no bigger stars. Were you, I mean, even though you've had success at that time, were you a little bit kind of like, that's Sammy Davis Jr., man? I mean, what, what was that like? Did you have any interaction with them at that time? I, I don't tend to do that. I don't know why. I just... I mean, it was so iconic, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah, sure, huge. But I'm always just comfortable with other known people, no matter who they are or how big. I'm just comfortable with right. it. I can't explain why. You're a natural at this thing I, called life, baby. <laughs> hi, how are you? But And I don't mind saying to them, I love you. You know, it, it, I'm just real. I'm not a starstruck person. Right. And I'm not, I have no problem going up to somebody and saying, I think you're great. But I don't do it. And that way, I just say, I love you. I just say it that way. So, like, I'm one of you, and I love you. I was doing, um, I did 15 years on BBC Radio 2, the other side of the microphone. And I did quite a few documentaries. I did a lot of everything. But one of them, I had to interview Dion, who's one of my heroes. He arrived at the studio to do it. I was on a chair. He was on a chair. Sunglasses on. I went right. First of all, sunglasses is a, is a big clue. Okay, you're not going to get in. So I did certain questions, zoom, zoom, because I'm quite smart. And finally, about 
three or four minutes into the interview, Dion took off his sunglasses and he went, okay, you got me. <laughs> wow. So then the interview really started, you know, That's because cool. I don't suffer, I don't suffer fools gladly. Yeah. I am a very feet on the ground girl. If you ask me a question, I'll give her my answer. I don't hide behind glasses in a baseball cap. Pretty much. I don't think that because I've sold 55 million, by the way. And I'm still sorry, I will it. correct that. You better. Um, I don't think that it makes me better than anybody else. It makes me successful at my chosen career. It doesn't make me better than anybody else. And I never act that way. And never. that's that's good. And I think it, you know, I think that's why people are drawn to you because you are I mean, you just happen to do something that's high profile. That's, that's I mean, all that's it. Doesn't mean I'm better than you. It just means I I was successful at the chosen career. That's all. And to that point, one of my favorite things about you is that you've never stopped recording. You've never stopped performing. I know your fans love it. What is your favorite thing about performing in front of a live audience? Because I can tell you're just having a ball. I'm a really corny person that way. Um, if I was born to do anything, I was born to entertain. I like seeing that audience, you know, and every audience is a different animal and you got to win them over. There's no guarantee you can, but you're better. And then they're there, you know, they go from this. I love the Saturday night crowd. <laughs> Pay my money. What can you do? And at the end, they're swinging from the chandeliers and I go, yes, <laughs> yes. I love to make them come out of themselves and be transported to a place of pure enjoyment. Boy, I just said that. I meant that pure enjoyment. Let me ask you this. Is that come from Detroit? Because I've had Michael Persh on this show as well as Brian Pastoria from Rhythm Core and, and Adrenaline, respectively, and they've both told me that when you perform in Detroit, you better bring it because they're giving up their Friday and Saturday night, and if you don't entertain them, they're going to let you know about it. Do you think that comes from your early days in Detroit? It, a lot of it is from Detroit. There's an edge there, but uh, really that attitude comes from my father, who was a musician all his life, and he pulled me aside at age 16. I'd been in the band for two years. All of his kids were together playing music, but he pulled me aside. And he said, it was in the house. And he said, I can see you're serious about this. I said, yeah, I am, Dad. I am. He said, okay, then I'm going to give you a bit of advice. I said, yes. He said, right. He said, first of all, this is a profession. This is your job. I went, right. And he said, also, if you're playing in front of 10 people or 10,000, every one of those people has gone into their pocket and taken money out and paid to see you, and you owe them. That is my attitude to the business. He gave me my work ethic. If you're not having a good time, it's not your fault. It's my fault. Right. Wow. And you could just keep kind of, you keep kind of segueing into my next question, which was what talk about your latest record. I love that you're still recording. What, talk about your latest record. Are you working on anything right now? Where do you get your ideas? Talk about how you're still doing it after all these years. The last two albums I did with my son, which came out unexpectedly, No Control and The Devil in Me. They charted all over the world. Um, the Devil in Me got the best reviews of my entire career. Um, right now, I'm working on an EP for USA release before my duet album, Susie Quattro and KT Tunstall. It's called Face to Face, comes out in 2023. I've got a production company now with my son. We're working with other artists. I am working also on my next proper album. Uh, I'm just going to release at the end of May book number six, which is wow. my, second poetry, my second poetry book. Uh, I'm working on my, I love saying this because it's so pretentious. I'm then going to be finishing work on my second novel. <laughs> That's awesome. Good How can the girl from Detroit City say my second novel? It's wonderful. Um, and I am Dr. Quattro. You know that I'm Dr. Quattro. Dr. That's Quattro. A, yeah. Uh, I just, uh, three words to describe me. I create, I communicate, and I entertain. Done. That's who I am. Well, I'm. you mentioned KT Stunstall, and I mentioned she was, she, you were, you know, you inspired her, but I got to tell you, she's one of my favorite musicians. When I saw her do that that thing on, in England, where she where she where she was replacing somebody, if I'm not mistaken, and she just I mean, 
Are you inspired by people like her? I mean, even after all these years, you have to be inspired well, by new I, music. I was, I always liked her a lot. And I always said in my interviews, I'd like to record with her. And then I saw a rough cut of my documentary, Susie Q, and she was on it. And I went, oh, I didn't know she was also a fan of me. So somehow we got together. We liked each other a lot. And we decided to write some songs and it turned into an album. And I played it for my husband. He's German. And he's Mr. Critic. That's just his nature. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, if, if, he, if he likes it, you're winning. So I played the whole thing. First thing he said was, how lucky you guys are that your voices blend so well. Who knew this? Right. We didn't know but blend. We've written everything on the album. And then at the end of it, I'm waiting for his comments. And he says, because English is not his first language. And I said, what do you think? And he went, I, I look for the English word. And I said, <laughs> quality. And he said, that's the word. Wow. That's Quality. awesome. This is going to turn the world upside down, this album. We somehow find a space between the two of us, a little bit of her, a little bit of me, and here we created something. So it's absolute magic. That's awesome. So how can people follow you on social media? I know you're on YouTube, correct? What other platforms could people follow you on? Uh, www.suzyquattro.com. I have Facebook. I'm on Instagram, Suzy Quattro Real. There's, um, that's every day. I have a joke of the week every Friday. Uh, there's a butterfly productions thing. Um, God, I'm everywhere. I'm a real social media person. You're a Renaissance woman. Yeah, I am. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, one, uh, one final question. Although, you know, we know it's not what it once was in your opinion, this is radio days where we talk about terrestrial radio, terrestrial radio as a medium. Radio is always important. Um, God, without radio, what would we do? You're talking about the radio nowadays? Yeah, because I think especially, I mean, my son doesn't understand how important radio was to our lives on a daily, daily basis. I mean, it's, it's changed, me? but it's still important, I think. I think radio is very important. Um, there's a difference between listening to something over the airwaves and listening to something in the privacy of your home that you've purchased. That's a whole different experience. When you listen to it on the airwaves, it becomes part of your daily routine, whatever you're doing. Oh yeah, I was going to the shop and I heard this song. It's different than sitting here and purposely putting on a track and listening to it. So radio is really the soundtrack of your life. I'm not gonna ask you about this. I'm just gonna put it out there. Susie Quattro belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm just going to say it. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to give your own plug. For people who don't understand the impact that this woman has had on music, you have your head in the sand. Susie, I want to thank you for coming on, sharing your story. It's been an honor. I'm a fan. Thank you so much and continued success. Thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susie. And as we wrap up, I want to thank you again for tuning in and please share this podcast with your friends. Thanks again to the extremely talented, still kicking ass, Susie Quattro. Today's show, again, is produced by Ron Robinson Studios. If you uh, need professional videos, photography, or drone content, head over to ronrobinsonstudios.com where you can hear previous episodes of this podcast there as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on Radio Days, the podcast. You can't go. All the plants are going to die.